welcome to the ME CFS Alert. I'm Deborah Waroff in very, very sunny Reno, Nevada. I'm standing in front of Mount Rose, part of the Sierra Nevada range. On the other side of Mount Rose is Lake Tahoe at the Incline Village Resort where chronic fatigue syndrome, as the CDC called it, or myalgic encephalitis, as we prefer, first came to the attention of the American public with a 300-person outbreak in the mid-1980s that was too big for the CDC to ignore. We're here in Reno to visit with the Whittemore-Peterson Institute, which is building up a fabulous outfit that can diagnose, research, and they promised me before I die, they will be able to cure me of this horrible disease. Okay, I'm here for the MECFS alert in Annette Whittemore's office at the Whittemore Peterson Institute. And Annette is the demure firebrand who founded this institute. And before we get into the nitty gritty of science, I'd like to know a little bit, how long ago was it, and at what moment, and exactly how did you get the idea of founding, of proceeding with something like this? Well, it was really in September of 2006, and uh, I began to think that this was actually going to be a possibility after a very short time um, of a quick study that was done over a summer. And um, I'd had some experience with the foundation and thought, you know, that's, we've got to do more than that. And at that point, I just remember thinking, all right, we're just going to take one step forward and see what happens. And we were able to go and then begin to present the idea. I think once I thought it was concrete, I thought I could begin to present this idea to the legislature, the Nevada State Legislature, and begin talking to others about it, see if would be a real possibility. So when you first went to the legislature with the idea, and presumably to people around town, mm -hmm. you already had in mind that it would be both curing people or seeking to cure people and doing research. Absolutely. From the very beginning, we knew that it needed to be a translational research institute, mm -hmm. and that is going from the patients, taking patient information, and going straight into the research department into those research laboratories to look for diagnostic markers of disease and taking that information, developing those diagnostics to help physicians diagnose and follow treatment. And then we really did want to have a place for the patients to go where they could get well again. So it's a complete picture. Of course, we should probably mention, in case the audience isn't familiar, that this is sort of the hotbed of MECFS here in Reno, Nevada. And your daughter, one of five children, mm -hmm. has been suffering from it for, for a long, long time. So it was through her? She actually became ill at the age of 11 and was diagnosed at 12. And so it's been a very, very long journey of many, many doctors and many different treatments. And I think that was really the impetus for all of this was realizing that we needed more doctors, we needed more information, and we certainly needed more effective treatments for patients. Now, you said something to me recently that you felt one of your most important goals was to create legitimacy for the patients. Could you go into that a little? I guess diagnostic markers is part of that, but I know there's more. Absolutely. Uh, the biggest problem, I think, is the misunderstanding around the disease and um, characterizing it really inappropriately. The disease is so much more serious and more debilitating than I think most of the uh, people <coughs> understand. And uh, the fact that it can be lifelong, that it can have serious consequences. I felt it was very, very important, as do most people in this field, that that information needs to be corrected and that we can best do that through hard, basic research, good basic research. Would it be fair to say that the general view of this is that the people who have it kind of are faking it or have false illness beliefs? Well, I, I, luckily I don't think that that is as big a problem in the United States as it is in other countries. Yeah. But I do think that patients run into physicians who don't understand and are unable to just strictly say, 
I know you're ill, but I don't know what to do about it. And instead they say, well, maybe it's not real. Maybe you could do this, maybe you can do that. And without really taking a thorough look into what's going on with these individuals. So once you build an institute and you dedicate it to the science and to the medicine mm. for a particular population, I do believe it gives validation without a doubt to the patients. Yeah. It gives them hope and yes, it hope. brings information out into the world that absolutely is needed. So. Yeah. Now, where do you think you are now? I know you've begin begun by drips and drabs. You've got a few patients already, although you haven't really officially cut the ribbon. Well, really, I, you know, when you say that, it's, it, it is in full swing. It's so, in full swing. Okay, uh, I'm sorry. very excited to tell you that um, all of the pieces have come together. So it's critical that we have basic research, mm -hmm. critical that we have a clinical laboratory, which we do now and that we have a full medical practice down below. So what we have mm. is a physician who brought in a, a full medical practice mm. and is evolving that practice into a neuroimmune practice. And as mm. so he's, because he's new, not in the field, but new in the space, mm. he's just getting kind of used to the entire working, setting it all up for us. And then he is beginning to take new patients and he has already started that process. But I wanted to give him a little bit of time, mm. we'll make a formal announcement, and he will be opening up more of his practice time. As a matter of fact, we're already in uh, conversations with a second doctor, so um, ah. we see three doctors downstairs mm. with a nurse practitioner, and um, that waiting room will certainly be very full. We're welcoming all of those patients as soon as possible. So you think maybe when school starts uh, at the university for the fall semester, Absolutely. you'll be... Absolutely. And the exciting thing is that the physician here wants to be a part of the academic community. Oh, that's good. And he wants to prepare lectures for students and be a teacher and a mentor. And we foresee eventually having residents here so that we can build new doctors that understand the disease and can go out into the world and treat these patients. Yes. Yeah. Well, now, I've been curious, talking about doctors, you have put together quite a good board of physicians, but a lot of them are people who I'm not familiar with. I don't know, I don't recall papers by them. How did, how did you find them all and put them together? Well, ab absolutely. When we first had the paper come out, there were quite a few doctors that had been waiting, I suspect, um, dealing with these patients. This and, is the yeah. M XMRV page? Yes, the XMRV paper. And they called us right away or they emailed and they said, you know, I'm interested in that. I feel like it's a unifying theory. I've been out here dealing with mm. patients unbeknownst to mm. most of the public and um, I'd like to be a part of the solution. I'd like to work with you. I've always wanted a research-based practice and we certainly at that time not having a physician were welcoming uh, individuals who wanted to work with us and wanted to send us patient samples and um, as we found those who we who thought like we did and mm. wanted to move this field forward we looked for individuals with expertise in different fields well, the dream and the idea is that we would have all of this expertise to be looking at the patients mm. to be looking at this disease and to help us bring uh, quicker solutions well that's encouraging to think there'll be more doctors coming along because some of some people are kind of wearing out who've been in this field for a long time. Well, that was another one of the big uh, impetuses to get this whole thing up and running mm -hmm. was the fact that so many of these very, very dedicated physicians mm -hmm. are getting to the point where they're going to be retiring and there just wasn't a group to come up and follow. And you can understand why that would be if there's so little knowledge in the field mm -hmm. and so many, so few tools. So if we can build that knowledge, if we can build those tools, and we can educate new young physicians to this patient population, I believe we're not gonna have any trouble after that. Mm -hmm. So and I, I realize that that's a, a lot of work. Yeah. We've had four students who've come through our research program who are now in medical school. Really, from UNR? Yeah, they, are in, they have come into the research program mm -hmm. from UNR as undergrads or master's students and are now in medical schools and are very excited because they know the background of the patients, they've been able to talk to the patients, they've seen and been a part of the research, and I think we're going to have some brilliant doctors out there that, that are gonna be able to 
uh, teach. They're yeah. going to be able to train new people, and you know, we're going to get at some point we'll have residents in here. So that's why we're here on a campus yeah. next door to a medical school. We're right next door and connected to a major group of researchers, and yeah. um, they're all going to be a part of this larger family. So we think we have a good chance at success. Yeah, I think I forgot to explain that when I say UNR, we're talking about the University of Nevada, Reno, which is one of the state university's two biggest campuses, along with Las Vegas. And in the recent years, they've really built up a lot of new facilities and new specialties, and they're really going gangbusters. So why don't you tell me about, you have a fundraiser coming up, and you're looking for contributions of art, if anyone has a Rembrandt tucked away in their bathroom that they don't need anymore, give it, send it to Annette here in Reno. Option. That's right. So tell us about that. Thank and it's you. a dance too, isn't it? Thank you. Thank you for that plug. Um, it is called I Hope You Dance. I Hope You Dance. Yeah, after the song of the same name. Um, we are, we have it every year and ah. it is our major fundraiser. It provides approximately a third of our support every mm -hmm. year. Wow. Um, we do do all fundraising all during the year, and as you know, um, private institutions like this, uh, uh, they rely on, on the generosity of private donors. Yeah, private institutions do need help and, from a wide base. Yeah, absolutely. So we're, that's always uh, important to mm -hmm. our mission is to not only raise awareness, but to raise the funds so that we can continue this important work. Well, you have a lot of support here in Reno, and of course you and your family are well known, and this is uh, a town that grew up from 30,000 people 40 years ago to 300,000 today, That's so yeah. there's, there's been a lot of change, but you are one of the core families here. Um, but how are we doing at getting people from outside, getting big money from, say, <sighs> California or New York? It's, it's coming along, and yeah. um, I think as individuals who are impacted by the disease mm. realize the significance of the work that's being done mm. here and the significance of this particular type of institution, mm. um, as we become better known, I really do think that those are, I, I hope that those kinds of donations will come along. Well, I want to say I thank you so much, and I think all the other 800,000 to a million suffers from this awful disease do too because I feel like this institute and you are lending a real focus and centripetal force to the engagement with this disease and I finally feel like we're going to get someplace. We are. Thank you, you Annette. Back again. I'll be back. Doctors. I'll doctors. be back. Thank, Thank you. you. So nice to be able to talk with you. Take care.